Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm from Portland Public Library and I'm one of the children's librarians there. I'm here again with some more from our book, Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. This book is published by Scholastic, who has uh, generously allowed us to read this to you. We're going to pick up where we left off, but if you missed yesterday or you can't remember what happened, let's go over it real fast. So Dealing with Dragons is about Cimmerine, who is the princess of Linderwall, but she really doesn't like being a princess because uh, she doesn't like all of the things that she has to do. She thinks they're boring to just sit around and do embroidery and etiquette lessons and not be able to do any of the things that she finds really interesting, like cooking and learning Latin and learning about magic and fencing. So her parents are very frustrated with this and they decide that she needs to marry a prince named Therindel, but she doesn't want that. So she runs away and asks a dragon if she can be her princess. The dragon's name is Kazul. And where we just left off, uh, Cimmerine was dealing with a lot of princes and knights coming to try to rescue her from Kazul, and she was having a tough time explaining to them that she did not want to be rescued. So let's dive in with chapter three, which is in which Cimmerine meets a witch and has doubts about a wizard. Therindale left, but he came back again the next day and the day after that. It got so that Cimmerine could not even step outside the cave without running into him. She might have been flattered if it hadn't been so obvious that Therindel was only worried about how foolish he would look if he went home without fighting the dragon. On his fifth visit, Cimmerine was very sharp with him, and when he did not return by mid-afternoon the next day, she began to hope that he had finally left for good. Cimmerine was in the kitchen taking the pits out of cherries when she heard someone knocking at the mouth of the cave. Go away, she shouted in complete exasperation. I've told you and told you I do not want to be rescued and I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I didn't come to argue, said a no-nonsense female voice from outside. I came to meet the person who keeps borrowing my crepe pan. It's not something that is normally called for. Oh dear, said Cimmerine. She wiped her hands hastily on a corner of her apron and hurried out to greet her visitor. I'm sorry, she said, coming around the gray rock at the cave mouth, but I've been having a problem with nights lately and I thought... She stopped short as she got a good look at her collar for the first time. The woman standing outside the cave was considerably shorter than Cimmerine. Her ginger hair was piled in waves on the top of her head she had on a loose black robe with long sleeve, which she wore and belted. A small pair of glasses with rectangular lenses sat firmly on her nose, and she carried an extremely twiggy broom in her left hand. Despite her unusual appearance, she projected an air of great self-assurance. I quite understand, she said, setting Cimmerine. You must be Kazul's new princess. Yes, I'm Cimmerine, and you are Morwen said the black-robed woman, leaning the broom against the rock. Kuzul and I have been friends for a very long time, ever since I moved to the Enchanted Forest, so I thought I'd come have a look at her new princess. You're the person Kuzul has been borrowing dishes from, aren't you? Samarine said and blinked. But then you must be a witch, Morwen finished. I don't see why you find it surprising. It's not exactly an unusual profession in these parts. It's just that I haven't met one before. Cimmerine said, not mentioning the fact that in Linderwall, witches were considered dangerous and probably evil, and were therefore to be avoided at all, po if all, at all possible. But then, people in Linderwall didn't really like dragons much either. Won't you come in and have some tea? I certainly will, said the witch, and she did. She prowled around like a nervous cat while Cimmerine put the kettle on the stove and got out the tea things. Well said Morwen approvingly, as Cimmerine filled the teapot. You are the first princess I've ever met who has the sense to keep up with the kitchen. Cimmerine decided that she liked Morwen's down-to-earth manner. She soon found herself telling Morwen everything, from the fencing and the philosophy and the Latin lessons to the seemingly endless stream of knights. 
The story lasted through two cups of tea and finished with Ferrandil's stubborn insistence on rescuing her. That's absurd, Morin said decidedly when Simmering finished. If this continues, you'll never get anything done. I know, Simmering said. I keep telling them I don't want to be rescued, but they're all so honorable that none of them will tell anyone when they go back because they think it would be gossiping. More likely, they don't want to look foolish. Maybe, but even if they did tell people, I'm not sure that anyone would believe it. I have hard enough time convincing the knights when they show up in person. Hmm, it's just as well that your visitors have been honorable, Morwen said, looking thoughtful. Linderwall is a prosperous kingdom. Sooner or later, the chance of getting hold of half of it is going to tempt someone to try to rescue you, whether you want to be rescued or not. That hadn't occurred to me, Sabrine said with a worried frown. What can I do about it? I'm not sure, Warren replied. The situation is not at all usual, you know. I've never heard of a princess volunteering for a dragon before, which is rather surprising if you think about it. A dragon's princess is practically guaranteed a good marriage, so you think that princesses from the smaller kingdoms would be clamoring for the job. They're probably worried about being eaten, Simmerine said. Do you think it would help if I sent my parents a letter? Probably not, Morwen said after a moment's consideration, but it can't hurt to try. I'll check my spell books when I get home. It may give me an idea. I suggest that you hunt through Kazul's library. It's been collecting scrolls for centuries. You ought to be able to find something useful. Meanwhile, we'll put up a sign. A sign? Simmerine stared at Morwen for a minute and then began to smile. Road washed out, she said. Use alternate route. Is that the kind of sign that you were thinking of? Exactly, Morwen said with approval. It won't stop anyone who's really determined, but it will certainly slow them down. That should give us time to come up with something better. The two women set off to, at work at once, and in a short time produced a large, official-looking sign. Morwen offered to set it up on her way back to the Enchanted Forest, but Simmerine thought it would be too awkward for her to carry while riding the broom. So once Morwen had gone, Simmerine tucked the sign under her arm and started down the path. Simmerine had not had any chance to do any real exploring before, though she had looked out on the mountains every day and wondered. She was happy to have an excuse to see more of the outside of her new home. It was a lovely day, warm and sunny, and at first the path was level and easy. Simmerine was just beginning to wonder whether everyone, anyone would believe her sign when she got it put up. When the path swung left around a boulder and narrowed to a tiny ledge that sloped steeply upward, Simmerine stopped. Now she knew why none of the knights had ridden up to the cave. The ledge was barely wide enough for a person on foot to edge along sideways. The best rider in the world couldn't have gotten a horse down it. Simmerine rolled up her sign into a firm, tight cylinder and stuck it through her belt so that she would have her hands free while she climbed. Then she sidestepped onto the ledge. Sliding up the slope took a long time, for Simmerine was careful to make sure that each part of the ledge would hold before she trusted her weight on it. She was also careful not to look down. Heights had never bothered her before, but there was a big difference between standing solidly on the top of a tower in Linderwall Castle, behind a four-foot parapet, and inching along a ledge barely six inches wide with nothing between her and a long fall. She had almost reached the top of the slope where the path widened again, when a portion of the ledge disappeared just in front of her. Simmerine pulled her foot back and tried to figure out what had happened. She hadn't seen or heard the rock crumble and fall away. There was simply a two-foot gap in the ledge that hadn't been there before. She studied it for a moment, trying to think of a way to get past. Nothing occurred to her. She felt a twinge of annoyance at the thought of all of her wasted efforts, but teared up once she realized that this would solve the problem of the visiting knights. If she couldn't get around or over the gap, an armored knight wouldn't be able to get by either. Simrine smiled and turned her head back to creep back to safety. There was another two-foot gap in the ledge on the other side. Simrine frowned. Something very odd was going on, and she did not like it. You look as if you are in need of assistance, a deep voice said from above her. May I be of help? Simmerine turned her head and saw a man standing four feet away on the path at the top of the ledge. He was tall and sharp-featured, and his 
eyes were a hard, bright black. Though he had a gray beard that reached nearly to his waist, his face did not look old. He wore loose robes made of blue and gray silk, and in one hand he held a staff as tall as himself made of a dark, polished wood. Possibly, Simmerine answered. She was certain that the man was a wizard, though she had never met one before, and she did not want to agree to anything until she was sure of what she was agreeing to. The court philosopher had always claimed that wizards were very tricky. May I know to whom I am speaking? I am the wizard Zemidar, the man said, and you must be Gazul's new princess. I hope you're not trying to wet, run away. It's not done, Simmerine said, feeling particularly annoyed because for once she was not doing anything improper. Yes, I'm Simmerine. Now, I was going to say it's not wise to run away from your dragon, the wizard corrected mildly. I believe it's done all the time. I'm sorry, Simmerine Sim said, but she did not try to explain, and I'm not running away. How did you know who I was? It seemed unlikely that I would find any other charming young lady walking so casually through the path of silver ice, Zeminar answered. He smiled. As you see, it is easy to find oneself in difficulties if one is not properly prepared. Simmerine decided that she did not like him. He reminded her of one of her father's courtiers, a humorless, sneaky little man who had paid her compliments only when he was after something, and who couldn't resist giving advice, even when nobody wanted it. The ledge was all here when I started, she said. An idea crossed her mind, and she looked hard at Seminar. I don't suppose you know what happened to the two missing bits? A flash of startled annoyance crossed the wizard's face. Then his expression smoothed back into a pleasant politeness. He shrugged. The pass of the silver ice is a strange place. Odd things frequently occur. Not like this, Simmerine muttered. She was sure now that the wizard had made the ledge vanish so that he could pretend to rescue her, but she had no idea why he would want her to think that she owed him a favor. Actually, it surprised her that he had destroyed the ledge. She didn't think the dragons would be too happy when they found out. Unless he hadn't really destroyed it. Uh, what did you say? Simmerine said, frowning uncertainly. Simmerine ignored him. Without looking down, she slid her right foot along the ledge. The rock felt firm and solid. She slowly transferred her weight and brought her left foot up beside her right. She shifted again, still careful not to look down, and slid her right foot forward once again. What are you doing? Zeminar demanded. Getting off the ledge, Zemarine replied. Oh, I should think that was obvious. One more step would bring her to the path, but Zeminar was squarely in her way. Would you mind moving back a little bit so I have somewhere to stand? Zeminar's eyes narrowed, but he backed up several paces and Zemarine stepped into the path. She wanted to see high. She wanted to heave a sigh of relief, but she did not. She wasn't going to let Zeminar have the satisfaction of knowing that she had been worried. Instead, she gave him her best royal smile, and said with polite insincerity, "Thank you for offering to help, but as you see, I wasn't needed. Do you stop by and by and visit sometime?" "I will," Zeminar said, as if he meant it. "And a good day to you, Princess Simmerine." And with that, he vanished. There was no smoke or fire or whirlwind. There wasn't even a shimmer in the air as he disappeared. He was simply and suddenly gone. Simmerine stared at the place where the wizard had been and felt a shiver run down her spine. It took a very powerful wizard indeed to vanish so quietly, and she still didn't know what he wanted. She shook herself and started down the path. She should worry about the wizard later. Right now she had to find a place to put up her sign so that she could get back to the cave. She didn't feel much like exploring anymore. She hadn't taken more than two or three steps when a dark shadow passed over her. Looking up startled, she saw a flash of yellow and green scales. An instant later, a dragon landed on the path in front of her, blocking the way completely. His tail hung over the edge and he had to keep his wings partly unfurled in order to stay in balance. Simmerine recognized him at once. It was the yellow-green dragon who had wanted to eat her the day she had arrived so unexpectedly in the dragon's cave. I saw the whole thing, the dragon said with a nasty, triumphant glee, running away and talking to a wizard. Just wait till Kazool hears. She'll be sorry she didn't let us eat you and be done with it. 
I offer you greetings and good fortune on your travels, so Marie said, figuring that it was best to be polite to anyone as large and toothy as a dragon, even if he wasn't being at all polite to her. I am not running away. Then what are you doing? Kazul doesn't have any business that would bring you down this side of the pass. I came to put out a sign to keep the knights away, so Marine said. That's ridiculous, the dragon sniffed. I've been on patrol in this part of the mountains for the past week, and I haven't seen or smelled even a hint of night. You haven't been by Kazul's cave then, so Marine said. At least nine of them have shown up there in the past week. Though for the past couple of days, it's been mostly a prince. Princes don't smell any different than knights, and I would have noticed if any of them were hanging around, the dragon said flatly. And what about that wizard you were talking to? Charge! shouted a familiar voice from the other side of the dragon. Serendil, Samarin shouted, I told you to go away. The yellow-green dragon twisted his long neck and glanced over his shoulder. He seemed to bunch together like a cat crouching. Then he sprang straight up in the air and Simmerine was blinded by the cloud of dust raised by the flapping of his enormous wings. She had the presence of mind to flatten herself back against the rock by the side of the path. And a moment later, she heard someone blundering by. She stuck out a foot. Ow! She said as Slarendil fell over with a clatter. She'd forgotten that he would be wearing iron boots along with the rest of his armor. Simmerine, is that you? Slarendil said. Of course it's me, Simmerine replied, rubbing her ankle. Open your eyes, the dust settled. She looked up as she spoke and saw the dragon soar out of sight behind a cliff. I'm sorry, Therendel said, and then in an anxious tone he added, I hope I didn't hurt you stumbling around like that. Simmerine started to say that it was nothing, and that it had been her fault anyway, when she suddenly got a much better idea. Oh, I think you sprained my ankle, she declared. Oh, no, Therendel said. He sounded truly dismayed, though Simmerine could not see his face because he was wearing his helmet with the visor down. I probably won't be able to walk for at least a month, she declared. There's certainly no way I can climb down this mountain. But, but if you can't walk, Therendel said, and he paused. Then he squared his shoulders and went on, then I suppose I'll have to carry you. He did not sound as if he liked the idea. I don't think that would work very well, Samarine said quickly. How will you fight when all the dragons come back if you're carrying me? No, no, you'll have to leave me here and go back alone. You can't stay here, Therendel protested, though Samarine's talk of when all the dragons come back had plainly made him nervous. I have to, Samarine said, trying to sound noble and long-suffering. The dragons will make sure I get safely back to Kazul's cave, and a month isn't too long to wait after all. Uh, I don't understand, Therendel said, and he did look thoroughly puzzled. There's no point in you or anyone else coming to rescue me for at least a month, not until my ankle's better, Zimmerine explained patiently. Oh, I see, Therendel said. He tilted his head back and scanned the empty sky. You're quite sure you'll be all right? Uh, then I'll just be going before those dragons return. He turned and started out down the path as quickly as he could manage in full armor. Chapter 4, in which Kazul has a dinner party and Simmerine makes a dessert. What kind of dessert do you think she'll make? Let's find out. Simmerine watched Therendel go with feelings of great relief. Now she had at least a month to find a permanent way of discouraging the knights, for she was quite certain that Therendel would spread the news of her injury. She decided to put up her sign anyway, just in case, and after a little looking, she found a scrubby tree beside the path and hung the sign on it. On her way back to Kazul's cave, she noticed that the two pieces of ledge were still invisible, and she was very careful about crossing them. She looked down once out of curiosity and was immediately sorry. She was not comfortable with the sight of her own feet firmly planted on nothing at all, with the sharp, spiky tops of spruce trees in full view, some 50 feet below. Kazul arrived only a few minutes after Simmerine herself. Simmerine was looking for some thread to mend her skirts, which had gotten torn and stained when she was climbing along the ledge. 
when she heard the unmistakable sounds of a dragon sliding into the main cave. Submarine, Gizul's voice called. Coming, Submarine called back, abandoning her search. She picked up her lamp and hurried up to greet Gizul. I'm glad to see you're still here, Gizul said mildly as Submarine came into the large cave. Morans was quite sure that you had run off with a knight or a wizard. I couldn't make out which for certain. Is Morans the yellow-green dragon who wanted to eat me? Samarine asked, because if he is, he's just trying to make trouble. I'm well aware of that, Kazul said with a sigh that sent a burnt bread smell halfway across the cave. But things would be easier for me if you didn't provide him with any material to make trouble with. Exactly what happened? Well, Morin came to visit this afternoon, Samarine began. We were talking about all the interruptions that I've been having, and she suggested putting up a sign. She explained why she'd gone to put up the sign herself and told Kazul in detail about her meetings with the wizard, the dragon, and the prince. So Morwen was here, Kazul said. She sat back and the scales on her tail rattled comfortably against the floor. That simplifies matters. Did you bring the sign back with you? No, I found a tree and hung it by the path, Simarine said wondering what this was all about, in case Therindil doesn't tell everyone about my ankle after all. Better still, Kazul said, and smiled fiercely, showing all her teeth. Morans is going to regret meddling. Meddling in what? My business. I'd like more of an explanation than that, if you don't mind giving one, Simarine said with a touch of exasperation. Kazul looked startled, then thoughtful. Then she nodded. I keep forgetting that you're not as empty-headed as most princesses, she said. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. This may yet take a while. Simmerine found a rock and sat on it. Kazul settled into a more restful position, folding her wings neatly along her back, and began. It has to do with status. Dragons aren't required to have princesses, you see. Most of us don't. There are never enough to go around, and some of us prefer not to deal with the annoyances that come with them. Knights, Simmerine guessed. Among other things, Kuzul said, nodding. So having a princess in residence has become a minor mark of high status among dragons. A minor mark? Kuzul smiled. I'm afraid so. It's the equivalent of, oh, serving expensive imported fruit at dinner. It's a nice way of showing everyone how rich you are, but you could make just a big impression by having some of those fancy pastries with the smooth glazed icing and sugar spun roses. I see, Samarine said. She did see, although she found herself wishing that Kazul had found something else to compare it to. The talk of dinner reminded her too much of Morin's repeated desire to eat her. Morin's is young and not very bright, I'm afraid, Kazul said, almost as if she had read Samarine's mind. He seems to have mistaken the impression that if a princess behaves badly, it reflects on the dragon who captured her. Possibly it comes from his inability to keep any of his own princesses for more than a week. Some of the lesser dragons were very snide about it when he lost his third one in a row. I believe she snuck out while he was napping. I don't see how he can blame his princesses, Samarine objected. I mean, if most princesses are unwilling, it must be fairly usual for them to try to get away. Of course, but Morans doesn't see it that way. He's been trying to catch someone else's princess in a similar foolishness, for years, and he's quite sure he's finally done it. He's undoubtedly spreading the story of your escape far and wide at this very moment. Oh dear, Samarine said. Kazul smiled again, and her teeth glittered silver in the lamplight. It'll look extremely foolish when it becomes obvious that you are still here, which is one reason I've asked a few of my friends to dinner tonight. You've what? Samarine said. All her worries about Morans were instantly replaced by worries about fixing dinner on such short notice for an unknown number of dragons. How many? What time will they be here? Where are you going to put them all? Six, around 8.30, in the banquet cave. And you won't be doing anything but dessert. I've already arranged the rest of the meal. Arranged? With whom? Balimor the giantess. She loaned me the cauldron of plenty that she uses when her twelve-headed son-in-law drops in for dinner unannounced. It'll handle most, most things, but all it can produce in the way of dessert is burnt mint custard and sour cream and onion ice cream. Ugh. 
said Zimmerine. I see your problem. Exactly. Can you manage? Not if you want Cherry's Jubilee, Zimmerine said, frowning. I haven't got a pot large enough to make seven dragons worth of Cherry's Jubilee. Would chocolate mousse do? I can make two or three batches, and there should be time for all of them to chill if you're not starting until 8.30. Chocolate mousse will be fine, Kazula assured her. Come along, and I'll show you where to bring it. Zimmerine picked up a lamp and followed Kazool into the public tunnels that surrounded Kazool's private cave. She was a little surprised, but when she saw the size of the banquet cave, she understood. It was enormous. Fifty or sixty dragons, perhaps even a hundred of them, would fit into it quite comfortably. Obviously, this had to be a public room. There simply wasn't enough space under the Mountains of Mourning for every dragon to have a cave this size. Kazul made sure that Zimmerine could find her way to the banquet cave without help, and then left her in the kitchen to melt slabs of chocolate and whip gallons of cream for the mousse. By the time that she finished, she was hot and tired, and she really wanted to take a nap. But Kazul was expecting her to serve the mousse, and Zimmerine was not about to appear before all those dragons in her old clothes, with sweaty straggles of hair sticking to her neck and a smear of chocolate across her nose. So instead of napping, she pumped a cauldron of water, heated it on the kitchen fire, and took a bath. Once she was clean, she felt much better. She checked to make sure that the mousse was setting properly and then went to her own rooms to decide what she should wear. Unfortunately, she was afraid that she did not have much choice. The wardrobe in her bedroom was full of neat, serviceable dresses suitable for cooking in or rummaging through treasure, but the only dressy clothes she had were the ones that she had arrived in. She got them out of the back of the wardrobe and found to her dismay that the hem of the gown was badly stained with mud from her long walk. There was no time to clean it. She would have to wear one of the everyday dresses. With a sigh, Samarine turned back to the wardrobe and opened it once more to look for the nicest of the ordinary clothes. She gasped in, in surprise. The hangers were now full of the most beautiful gowns she had ever seen. Some were silk and some were velvet, some were heavy brocade and some were, la were layers of feather light gauze. Some were embroidered with gold or silver and some were sewn with jewels. Well, of course, Simmerine said aloud after a stunned moment. Why wouldn't a dragon have, why would a dragon have an ordinary wardrobe? Of course it's magic. What's in it depends on what I'm looking for. One of the wardrobe doors waggled slightly, and its hinges creaked in smug agreement. Samarine blinked at it and then shook herself and began to look through the gowns. She cho chose one of red velvet, heavily embroidered with gold, and found matching slippers in the bottom of the obliging wardrobe. She let her black hair hang down in loose waves nearly to her feet, and even dug her crown under the back of the drawer where she'd stuffed it on her first night. She finished getting ready a few minutes early, and feeling cheerful, she went to the kitchen to fetch the mousse. It took Simmerine four trips to get the mousse down to the serving area just off the banquet cave. A dragon-sized serving was a little over a bucket full, and she could barely manage to carry two at a time. When everything was ready, she stood in the serving area and waited nervously for Kazul to ring for dessert. She could hear the muffled booming of the dragon's voices through the heavy oak door, but she could not make out what any of them were saying. The bell rang at last, summoning Simmerine to serve dessert. She carried the mousse into the banquet cavern, two servings at a time, and set it in front of Kazul and her guests. The dragons were crouched around a shoulder-high slab of white stove. Simmerine had to be very careful about lifting the mousse up onto it. Fortunately, she did not have to wonder which dragon to serve first. She could tell which dragons were most important from their places at the table, and she made a silent apology to her protocol teacher, who had insisted that she learn about seating arrangements. Protocol had been one of the princess lessons that Simmerine had hated the most. As she set the last serving in front of Kazool, one of the other dragons said in a disgruntled, vaguely familiar voice, I see the rumors are wrong again, Kazool. Or did you have to go after her and haul her back the way the rest of us do? Simmerine turned angrily, but before she could say anything, a large gray-green dragon on the other side of the stone slab said, Nonsense, Wara. Girls got more sense than that. You shouldn't listen to gossip. 
Next thing you'll know, you'll be chasing after that imaginary wizard Garum spent on about. Cimmerian recognized the speaker at once. He was Roxine, the elderly dragon that she had given four of her handkerchiefs to. I suppose it was that idiot Morantz again trying to cause trouble, a purple-green dragon said with a bored distaste. Someone should do something about him. Gazul still hasn't answered my question, Morag said, and his tail lashed once like the tail of an angry cat. And I'd like her to do so if the rest of you would stop sidetracking the conversation. Here now, Roxum said indignantly. That is a bit strong, Warog. Too strong, if you ask me. I didn't, Warog said. I asked Kazool, and I am still waiting. I'm very pleased with my princess, Kazool said mildly. And no, I did not have to haul her back, as you would realize if you had given the matter a little thought. Or does your princess normally leave seven servings of chocolate mousse in the kitchen when she runs away? Here, here, Roxim said. Simmery noticed with interest that Warg's scales had turned an even brighter shade of green than normal, and that he was starting to smell faintly of brimstone. One of these days you'll go too far, Kazul said. You started it, Kazul pointed out. She turned to the gray dragon. What's this about Gorim and a, a wizard, Roxim? You haven't heard, Roxim said, setting surprise. Gorim's been raving about it for weeks. Someone snuck into her cave and stole a book from her library. No traces, but for some reason she's positive it was a wizard. Achoo! Roxim sneezed, emitting a ball of flame that just missed hitting his bowl of moose. Gives me an allergy attack just thinking about it. Well, if it wasn't a wizard, who was it? The dragon at the far end of the table asked. Could have been anybody. An elf? A dwarf? Even a human, Maxine responded. No reason to think it was a wizard just because Garum didn't catch him in the act. No one with the amount of time, not with the amount of time that she spends away from home. What book did she lose? Said the thin brownish green dragon next to Kazul. What does it matter? The purple green dragon muttered. Some history or other. And that's the other thing. What would a wizard want with a, wi a history book? No, no, Gorham's making a lot of fuss over a common thief. That's what I say. It could have been a wizard, said the dragon at the far end. Who knows why they want the things that they want? Ridiculous, Gorham replied with vigor. Roxim replied with a vigor. A uh, wizard wouldn't dare come through this part of the mountains. And you know, they know what we do to them by George. Beg pardon he said to the silver-green dragon next to him, who appeared to have been rather shocked by his language. I'm afraid you're wrong there, Kazul said. Simmerine met one today, less than a two-minute flight from my cave. What? What? You're sure? Roxim said. That's done it, the purple-green dragon rolled his head in an irritated gesture so that his scales made a scratching noise as they rubbed together. You'll never get him to quit talking about it now. Quite sure, Simmerine assured Roxim after glancing at Kazool to make sure she was expected to answer Roxim's question for herself. He made two bits of the ledge that I was standing on turn invisible, so I would think that it wasn't safe to keep going. Certainly sounds like a wizard to me, the dragon at the far end commented. What did he look like? asked the silver green dragon. Simmerine described the wizard as well as she could and then added, he said his name was Zeminar. Zeminar, that's ridiculous, Warwick snorted. Zeminar was elected the head of the Society of Wizards last year. He wouldn't waste his time playing games with someone's princess. Not unless he had a great deal to gain by it, the thin dragon said in a thoughtful tone. She turned her head and looked speculatively at Simmerine. Such as, Warwick said. He waited a moment, but no one answered. No, I can't believe it was Zeminar. The girls made a mistake, that's all. Perhaps it wasn't him, Simmerine said, holding on to her temper as hard as she could. I've never met Zamnar, so I wouldn't know, but that's who he said he was. And wouldn't it be amusing if she were right, the purple-green dragon said, showing some interest in the proceedings for the very first time. I don't see that it matters, the silver-green dragon said. The important thing is that a wizard was in poking around smack dab in the middle of our mountains. What are we going to do about it? Tell King Takez, Roxim said. His job is to handle this sort of thing, isn't it? 
what can Takas do, Warog said, and there was a faint undercurrent of contempt in his tone. He could use the king's crystal to find out what the wizards are really doing, the thin dragon said in a prim tone. He won't use the king crystal for anything less than a full-fledged war, Warug said. And why should he? What could Tokas do even if he did find out some wizard was preying on poor defenseless dragons like Gorum? Lodge a form of protest to the society of wizards, Ruxin answered promptly, ignoring Warug's sarcasm. Proper thing to do, no question. Then the next time anyone sees a wizard, his voice trailed off and he snapped his teeth together suggestively. He'll probably just come up with a committee. The purple green dragon said. Can't anyone think of something else? I don't think we should do anything until we have some idea what Semnar is after, said the thin dragon. It could be important. We have to do something, the silver green dragon dra said. Her claws clashed against the stone table. We can't have wizards wandering in and out whenever they please. Well, we'll lose half our magic in no time. Not to mention everyone sneezing themselves silly every time one of those dreaded staffs get too close, added the dragon at the far end. The dragons began arguing among themselves about what to do and how best to do it. It reminded Simmerine of the way that her father's ministers argued. Everyone seemed to agree that something ought to be done about the wizards, but they each had a different idea about what was appropriate. Roxim insisted huffily that the only way to do things was to inform the king, who would make a formal protest. The thin dragon wanted to find out what the wizards were up to. She didn't say how this was to be done before anyone tried to chase them off. The silver green dragon wanted patrols to be sent out immediately to eat any wizard who ventured into the mountains of mourning. The dragon at the far end of the table wanted to attack the headquarters of the, of the society of wizards the following morning. And the purple green dragon thought it would be most entertaining to wait and see what the wizards did next. Warwick was the only one of the guests who did not have a proposal though he made occasional comments, usually sarcastic ones, about everyone else's suggestions. Gazool did not say anything at all. Simmerine was at first surprised and then puzzled by her silence, since Gazool was the one who had set the whole discussion going to begin with. As the argument grew more heated, however, Simmerine began to be glad that there was at least one dragon present who was not involved in it. The dragon at the far end of the table was starting to breathe little tongues of fire, at the purple green dragon, and Roxim was threatening loudly to have another allergy attack. But Simmerine was fairly sure that Gazul would stop the discussion before things got completely out of hand. She was right. A moment later, while the dragon at the far end was taking a deep breath to continue arguing, and the thin dragon was winding up a long involved train of logical reasons why her proposal was the best, Gazul said, Thank you for your advice. I'll certainly think about it before I decide what to do. What do you mean by that? The thin dragon asked suspiciously. It was my princess who met the wizard, Gazul pointed out. Therefore, it is my decision whether to report the matter to the king or take some action on my own or ask for cooperation from some of you. None of the other dragons appeared to like hearing this, but to Simmerine's surprise, none of them gave Gazul any argument about it. The dragon at the far end of the table made a few half-hearted grumbles, but that was all. And then the conversation turned to the intricacies of several draconian romances that were currently in progress. As soon as her guests appeared to have calmed down, Kazula gave the signal for the empty moose dishes to be taken away. So Simmerine only heard a few incomprehensible snatches of the new conversation. She did not really mind. She had plenty to think about already. And that's the end of this chapter. And that's the end of our reading today. We'll start tomorrow with chapter five in which Simmerine receives a formal call from her companions in dire captivity. Thank you for listening to me read from Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. This book, again, is um, published by Scholastic, and they've been very generous in letting us read this to you. I'm Sarah Murray from Portland Public Library, and I hope to see you again here tomorrow. Bye!